don't know what your week has been like. I don't know how much of an attack the enemy has mounted against you. I don't know how much you failed and came short of what you really wanted to do this week. This is what I do know, that you're here today because it's his breath that's in our lungs. It's his that causes us to inhale. So no matter what hell you've been through, God is worthy of our praise. And whether you're here in the actual sanctuary or you're in the sanctuary at home, God deserves your praise. God deserves your praise. While you're looking for somebody else to do it, while you're trying to watch somebody else do it, nobody know like you know how good God has been to you. Nobody know like you know how he steered the car from an accident. How God favored you when the bullet went the other way. Nobody knows like you know how good God has been that he didn't pull the cover off of you while you was in the midst of your mess. He deserved our best praise. I'm not going to tell you, you just got to praise him yourself. You got to speak in your own language. You got to give your own thank you. I know he's been good to this boy here. He has been good to me. He's heard my prayer. He's heard my cry. Yeah, he has done that. And you ought to give him some praise. You ought to give him your best praise. It's Sunday morning. You ought to give him your best praise. What you waiting on? Listen, whatever you're going through, you're going through it. Ain't neither you complaining. Ain't neither you whining. Ain't you talking about how bad it's been. You're still here. You're still here. You're still here. Listen, I don't care if you're at home in your, in your pajamas. I don't care if you're riding down the street and you're listening to this. God wants your praise. God wants your praise. God is seeking those to worship him in spirit and in truth. So we bless God today. One more time, give God a hand clap of praise. Lift up your voices and bless the Lord. I look around this sanctuary and see so many blessings, so many, so many, so many blessings. JB, Joe, in the house today. He's in the hospital house the other day, but he's in the house today. So many blessings, so many blessings. So many blessings. I ain't got time, I ain't got time. So many blessings, so, so, so. He's been so good. Yeah, so good. He, he's been so good. Charles, he's been, he's been just, he's been so, so good. So, so, so good, so good. So good. He's been so so, so good. good. Look beyond our fault. He's been so You've good. Been so Fought good. our battles. He's been so good. He You've put food so on the table. Good. So good. Paid our You've bills. Got a roof so on our head. He's been so Oh! 
And Father, I know that this is worship, and it's worship for you. And I know there's human beings who watch, and they want so much to happen so fast, so often, because their attention span isn't what it used to be. But God, I need you to minister to your people. They need more than a shout. They need more than a hand clap. They, they need your presence. They need your power. They need healing from the inside. They need a renewed mind. They need to think different. They need a new tongue to talk with. They, they, they need you, God. They really, really need you. And I pray in this moment that you would come and fix our hearts and fix our minds and fix our bodies, fix the situation going on around us right now that we might be able to focus on what you have prepared for us as we have poured out our worship on you. Pour your word in us that we may be thoroughly equipped and empower to do your will. Speak to me, speak through me, speak in spite of me that your will might be done. Souls might be saved. You might get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray and we do give thanks and the saints of God said amen. I'm sorry for how long this might be, but I'm not. Just a disclaimer. I want to begin a series that God impregnated me with a couple of months ago of a need that is real and relevant in our church, in our country, in our world, in our lives today. A series that's going to walk us through the majority of John chapter 4. And I share that with you, El Bethel, because my heart's desire is that for us to get the most meat out of this, I need you to partner with me. And I want to encourage you to take on John chapter 4 as a daily reading that every day you would take time out to read this one chapter. You can read whatever else, but I, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit and the Holy Word of God to minister to you and to meet you where he need to meet you so that when we meet together, <laughs> he might really show you what he want us collectively to do. Would you do that? Whether you're in this sanctuary or you're at home at the home sanctuary, wherever you are, I encourage you to join us in this reading of John chapter 4. Today I'm just going to focus on the first six verses. And I'm reading from the easy to read version, so it may be a little different than what you see on the screen, but just stay with me and say about the same but I'm trying to reach some people that don't go to church all the time. So Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard the report that he was making and baptizing more followers than John. But really, Jesus did not baptize anyone. His followers baptized people for him. So he left Judea and went back to Galilee. And on the way to Galilee, he had to. Somebody say had to. He had to go through the country of Samaria. In Samaria, Jesus came to a town called Sychar, which is near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired. Somebody said Jesus was tired. Yeah. 
Jesus was tired from his long trip, so he sat down beside the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to get some water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. I done went too far. This text do that to you. I want to tag this text for the day. I want to talk about it's time for a change of plans. You may be seated. It's time for a change of plans. It is said to succeed, Joe, that you must plan your work and work your plan. But it also should be known that before you plan your work, you must know your purpose. For our purpose is what determines which plans we make. If you plan on baking a cake, if your purpose, rather, is to bake a cake, then your plans will include doing some shopping for the items that you need to bake a cake. When our plans don't, land up, don't line up with our purpose, then it's time to change your plans. Jesus knew his purpose. He knew and declared several times that his purpose was to do the will of him who sent him, his father. And daily he went about his business to fulfill his purpose, to seek and to do what pleased his father. And though he went about his plans to travel here and there, often he was interrupted. Often he had to change his plans while he was living out his purpose because somebody touched the hem of his garment. Because there was a man up in the tree because there was, there, there was a, a leopard that needed a touch. Sometimes because somebody was being lowered into the house where he was teaching. He would have to change his plans to continue fulfilling his father's purpose for his life. But there are often obstacles and obstructions that seek to hinder us in our progress and then there are roads, paths, or bridges that need to be made or built to unite individuals who are out of the will of God with the will of God. Jesus knew his purpose. Jesus knew his mission. We, too, have a mission. None of us are here by accident. None of us have survived COVID this long by accident or coincident or because we're so smart or so strong. No, you and I are still here because we have a purpose. We need to discover our purpose, develop our gifts, display our skills, declare God as the source of all of our resources, and then help others to discover their purpose. And you need to know that despite your weaknesses, despite your waywardness, despite your wickedness, God woke you up this morning and gave you another chance because he believes that your future is better than your past. He believes that your mission is greater than your mess-ups, that his purpose is greater than your personal agenda. So in this series, I, 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 I attempt to address some long-standing barriers that keep people from knowing God and experience God's best for them. They are bridges that need to be built to help them to get from point A to point P to point B to fulfill God's purpose for their lives. Come to the text. Come to the text. Our text comes from the Gospel of John. This text that God would have me to highlight for us over the next coming weeks is John's attempt to prove a point that he made in John chapter 3, when he had a, a night class with a religious ruler by the name of Nicodemus. The rich ruler was, the rich religious guy was too proud to come see Jesus during the day. 
So he came at night. And Jesus showed how much he cared for people because he was willing to meet Nick at night on Nick's terms. And I need to tell somebody who's too ashamed and too afraid to call on God in the midst of a crowd that God will meet you on your terms, that you can pray and talk to him anytime, that you don't have to wait till you get in the crowd if you really want to know him. Now, John had told this religious leader that, um, I mean, Jesus had told this religious leader that uh, the kingdom of God is, could only be seen by those who have been born again. Jesus took time to talk to this morally upright man, tell him that you can only see the kingdom of God. The man came to him, told him, we know you are a man of God, come from God because of the works that you do. And Jesus said, look, you, you got to be born again, but you can't be born again. Uh, I mean, you can't see the kingdom until you are born again. He said, how can you do that? Jesus said, it's real simple. It's real simple. To be born, all you got to do is believe. It's real simple. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to do cartwheels. He said, simply believe. He said, now why would God make salvation? Why would God be uh, uh, make getting into the kingdom, seeing the kingdom, and getting into the kingdom so simple as believing? He said, because God loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But, but, but John, the writer of our text, wanted us to know that God did, don't, don't just love morally upright people. God don't just love the up and out, but God loves the down and out. He loves people who have got caught up in relationships that never seem to work. He loves people who only have two fish and five loaves of bread. They got to pay a whole house note full of bills. He loves people who've been sitting at a pool chronically ill so long that people just overlook them and walk right by them. He loves people who've been caught in the midst of, the, of their mess, caught in bed with somebody they had no business being with. He loves people who were born with stuff that other folks judged them on when it wasn't they fault or their family fault. It was just God's purpose for them to be born a certain way. He loves us all. And so he wanted, John wanted to point this out to make this real and relevant of how God loves all people, all people. He loves all people, black people, white people, religious people, rich people. God loves all people. Yeah, he, 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 loves, he loves us all. He loves us all. Can you say he, he loves us all? In this chapter, we'll see that uh, there are barriers and breaches obstacles and openings that get in the way and keep us from experience the awesome love of God. And it bothers people because people start to think that God is prejudiced. People get the perception that God is biased, that God only love and like and bless people who go to church all the time. God only blessed and like and favor people whose family legacy is clean and clear. That God actually is biased and bigoted, but no, that's not the God I serve. And the barriers must be broken and bridges need to be built to connect the fact that God loves us all. You may not feel like it, but you need to know this, that God loves you. I said God loves you, and God believes in you. And this morning, because he woke you up, I know he trusts you. Yeah, yeah, and all he wants from you is to do the same to him what he does to you, to love him, believe in him, and trust him. And I, I say this because I know he loves us all because of three things. I know he loves us all because he made us all in his image. All of us made in his image. I know he loves us all because on Calvary, he died for us all. I know he loves us all because three days later, he got up for us all. 
Whenever the love of God is not experienced, something needs to be done. There's a blockage there. There's a bridge that need, need to be built there. Yeah. So go closer, get closer to this text. The text talks about when Jesus learned or heard that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had baptized more than John the Baptist. That's when Jesus ha had a change of plans. That he had a change of plans because his purpose was to unite a sinful man with a holy God. And, and somebody was taking his good deeds and causing others to get distracted from it. And Jesus realized that what he was doing, watch this, what he was doing had started not to help him fulfill his purpose, but to hinder him from fulfilling his purpose. He said, I got to change. I got to change. I, I didn't come here for that. I didn't, I didn't come here for that. I, I came to do the will of him who sent me. I, I did not come here to cause people to, to be divided. I came here to unite people. You must know, you must know, we live in a sin-cursed world that is so insecure that without the love of God, the only way many can lift themselves up is to put others down. The only way we can feel good about ourselves is to feel bad about other people. We live in a sin-cursed world that thinks that the problem with the world uh, is that so many people is different than them. The problem with the world are those who look different, talk different, smell different, sing different, walk different, shout different, eat different, laugh different, dress different, play different, vote different, why drive different, live different, and worship different. Reverend, that's the problem. All these different folks in the world. How come they can't walk like me? How come they can't eat like me? How come they can't worship like me? And people who are different, we think they ought to be despised. We think they ought to be disposed. They definitely should be distant from us. And some of y'all have heard me sing my little theme song that I got from Snoop or one of the rappers. It's my theme song. I don't mind. Even though the church, I wish y'all at home could see the folks here. They kind of dressed up for this first Sunday. My deacons all suited and booted. Preachers kind of dressed up. And I'm dressed in this little T-shirt and everything. And my little theme song has been for the last several years. I'm different. Yeah, I'm different. I'm different. Yeah, I'm different. I don't have a problem being different because God made me different. He made you different. And you need to embrace your differentness, your uniqueness. We are different. We are different. We have different likes and dislikes. We have different taste buds. We, we have different passions and different dreams. But our differences are not a reason or a rationale to build walls and distance ourselves from people who are different than us. Yeah, we are different. We are different because he made us all in his image. He made us all in his image, which means none of us captures all of him. <laughs> None of us is the epitome of him. None of us represents the totality of him. God is so great and so awesome that it takes all of us just to come close to showing the rest of us what he looks like, talk like, walk like, and love like. And when we dismiss or discount any human being, that's because, that's because, that's because we are discounting and dismissing God. Jesus knew this, and he came to do the will of the Father in building a bridge from a holy God to an unholy, unholy man. And to build bridges, we must first address the barrier that stands between us and God. And before Jesus could build the bridge later in this chapter that would cover the gaps of racism, gender bias, and religious prejudice, 
he had to break a barrier that stood in the way of the bridge. The text says, again, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that the report he was making and baptizing, the uh, report was he was making and baptizing more disciples or followers than John. Again, he, he knew his purpose, and he came to live his purpose. Yeah, but when he realized that uh, the Pharisees was going to use this data information, that his numbers had started to exceed the numbers of that radical country preacher, that, he would use, that, the, that they would use that information to divide the people or to pit one against another. He said, I'm out of here. I didn't come here for that. You see, the Pharisees, they didn't care for John the Baptist. He was a little country guy that started a ministry out in the country. Nobody thought that nobody would go over there. They weren't paying no attention. He didn't eat like them. He didn't dress like them. He was just a little country bumpkin. And lo and behold, you never underestimate, never underestimate, never underestimate, never underestimate who God can use and who God would choose. <laughs> Folks started flocking from the temple going out to the country to see who is this who is saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. They didn't care for John the Baptist, but now here comes this little other itinerant preacher, little carpenter boy, Joe's boy, they called him. He started ministry, and the word was that this boy had some power. The word was that this boy got invited to a wedding. They ran out of joy juice. He told them to bring some water. He took some water, looked at it, and it blushed and turned into wine. The word is that this new preacher has some power that even the people who had followed John were leaving John to follow him. So the Pharisees were going to pit one against another. And you know what bothers, what messes up our world and what has our country in such a fix is not the politicians, it's not just the parents. The parents do play a role. No one should have more influence over your children than you who birthed them, you who nursed them, you who sent them to school and bought their first everything. You do play a role. But what really messed up the world is the church, the preachers, the people. Because when we are divided, the world is divided. And we allow the enemy of God and the enemy of our soul to throw this fair circle argument at us. As if one church is bigger or better than another church. As if El Bethel is in competition with their new hope. As if the potter's house is in competition with word of faith. That we get this competition mindset all going on. And the enemy just sit back and laugh at it because here we have Christian, bad mouth, and other Christians <laughs> over what comes down to being nothing but pride. God's at my church. We the Holy Ghost headquarters. Get out of town. God will not be captured by any group of people. The same God that's in Dallas is in Detroit. The same God that's in Redford is in Reno. The same God that's in America is in Africa. The same God. And he will not be boxed in. We get this competition thing going on. That's when it's time to change, change plans. When your plans got you doing things that override your purpose and derail your purpose. God did not send us here. Leave us here for us to compete one with another. Now, he told us to do a lot of one another things. But competing is not one of them. He told us to pray for one another to serve one another, to help one another, to honor one another, 
to build up one another, be devoted to one another, accept one another, forgive one another, be patient with one another, comfort one another, bear one another's burdens, teach one another, even confess your faults to one another. But nowhere does God say we ought to compete with one another. Our world all caught up in this division stuff, competing one with another. I'm right, no, I'm right, I'm right, no, I'm right. Because church allows that mindset to go on. We are not competitors. We are companions in Christ. The Bible says we are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet, the, the eyes and ears, the legs and arms, the nose and mouth, the liver and kidney of Christ. We are the body of Christ. The eyes can't say to the ears because you can't see. You're not part of the body. The hands can't say to the feet because you can't write. You're not part of the body. We need each other. And any church that finds itself in competition with another church needs to repent and rejoice with the fact that God gives grace to us all. Jesus saw that his works, his plans was going to cause the vision where he was trying to bring unity. And because of that, he had a change of plans. Yeah, he had a change, change of plans. And you'd probably need to pause every now and then and evaluate what you're doing. Because us human beings, we are people, creatures of repetitive nature, you know. We're, we're pattern driven. We like to do the same old thing over and over and over because it's comfortable and convenient. We, we don't like to stretch our brains, our minds, and then we wonder why we start getting signs of dementia. Perhaps if you push yourself to the limit God allows you to be pushed, you keep your brain stimulated. But let me, let me press on. Let me press on. It's time to change your plans when your plans are overriding or derailing your purpose. And the text says, when he realized that the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing more than others, he left Judea. Let me talk about Judea for just a moment. I press on give you other point. Judea was the place where he was born, Jerusalem, Bethlehem of Judea is where he was born. He had, he, he had done some things there in, in Judea. It was a great time there in, 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 in Judea, uh, but he left as a baby. He came back as a man there in Judea. He would die as a sinner, but he got up like a savior. It was in Judea that he had that midnight talk with Nicodemus. Yeah, it, it, was, it was in Judea. It was, it was in Judea that he told him, you must be, be born again. And he, he was leaving there to go to Galilee. His plans changed from staying in Judea to going to Galilee again. And he says again because Galilee was the place where though he was born in, in Judea, he was raised in Galilee. And Nazareth is where his parents took him to when he was a child. It was in Nazareth where he turned the joy juice, turned the water into joy juice. It was in Nazareth that, that he taught them that, listen, your, your, your purpose must be firm, but your plans must be flexible because it's here that we see that uh, in the text it says that he said, he, uh, uh, verse 4 said that he had to go through Samaria. He must go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. Now, let me, let me unpack this real quick. Samaria was the land in between Judea, which was south, and Galilee, which was north. There was a parcel of land on the side of the Jordan River that was Samaria. Samaria was the place where Jews, some Jews had been relocated uh, years ago uh, when they was in uh, captivity, going to make this relevant to you in a minute, but put, uh, uh, people had been relocated uh, in captivity where we had Jews and non-Jews living together. And while they were living together, they decided, well, see, we're living together, we might as well mate together. 
And those Jews who wasn't in that situation, who did not have an option to marry their own kind, those Jews who are, 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 are only married Jews, they frowned upon Samaritans. In fact, they, they looked so bad down on, on Samaritans that, that if, a, if a Samaritan dropped out of a cup, they couldn't drink out of the cup. If a Samaritan ate out of a plate, they couldn't eat out of a plate. In fact, it got so bad that if a Samaritan shadow came upon you and you were a Jew, you were considered unclean. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they considered Samaritans half-breeds. Yeah, yeah, half, half-breeds, half, half-breeds. And, and what the Jews of Jesus' day and too many of our day fail to comprehend, that any child that is born and have life, may be of any race or any mixture, but whatever the makeup of their parents may be, every human being that comes to planet Earth and have life, every human being that lives on planet Earth, regardless of the percentage of their race, they are 100% made in the image of God. They are 100% loved by God, valued by God. God died for them all just as much as he died for the Pope. We live in a season, time of racist, religious bigotry. And we use scripture to back it up. This Jewish Samaritan barrier that existed in Jesus' day was nothing new. It was a barrier that had been built years ago. But you need to know that just because something has tradition behind it, don't make it righteous. Just because something has time behind it, don't make it righteous. Anything that stands between the love of God and the people that he loved need to be dealt with need not to be accepted, even if it's accepted by our culture, it ought not to be accepted by the people who believe in God. Yeah, it, it doesn't, 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 doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what other folks say. It matters what God says. Here's what I picked up out of this text. Again, that Jesus changed his plans, and we ought to change our plans when our plans override our purpose. You got to know your purpose. But then his plans change when his father said so. Because when the text says he had to go to Samaria, the reason why he had to go to Samaria is because his daddy told him so. I need to help somebody. Because your plans, you ought to have plans. I tell folks, you ought to have plans. You ought not to go by the winds as it blows. This day I'm going this way and this day I'm going that way. No, God don't want you to be like that. God wants you to have dreams and plans and, and, and plans for what's, what you got going on and what his will is for you. In fact, if he's an awesome God as you think he is, as you know him to be, he planned for you. He built this world before you got here. He got your parents here before he, you got here. He planned for you. Then you ought to have plans for your life. Go on and work your, go on and make your plans and, and work your plans, but you need to have included in your plans some God time. You've got to put God in your plans. That's what Jesus allowed every day of his life while he was doing the Father's will. Whatever the Father spoke to him, Randy, whatever the Father said, go here or stop here, Jesus was willing to do that. And our plans, our, our plans ought to be adjusted when God say so, when God say so, that's when it's time to change your plan. He had to go to Samaria. Now, again, uh, it, it wasn't custom that he would travel through Samaria because uh, I told you some, uh, uh, Judea was down here. Uh, uh, Galilee was up there. And actually, it was an 80-mile walk from Judea to Galilee. Samaria, Sychar, is halfway. And he normally... The Jews would go around Samaria because they did not want to be considered defiled. They did not want to be considered touched by one of them folks. Because racism is nothing new, my sisters and brothers. 
Racism is nothing new. Ageism is nothing new. No, no, no. Sexism is nothing new. Uh, and Jews would not go through Samaria. They'd go around Samaria. But the text says that Jesus had to go. And every now and then, God would give you a, a, a directive. Every now and then, God would give you a direct uh, 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 order to, to go and do something. And that's when your plans have to change. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you got to be willing to go with the flow. You, you got to be willing to obey God as God speaks to you. And when the text said he had to, he must, he needed to go through Samaria, all it meant was that God gave him a direct order. That was not optional. Remember, we are here to do his will, a will that we discover daily. You need to make your plans and plan your best for God who planned his best for you. But our plans are subject to change whenever he says so. Can I suggest to you that part of the purpose uh, for COVID, the reason why I believe God allowed COVID to come into our world, this invisible enemy, is to, is to show us that we are all victims of this. That we all have this common enemy. That this enemy has no respect of person, no respect of position, no respect of place. This virus has taken on the rich and the poor. That we are universal people that better learn how to unify. And in the words of, of the late Martin Luther King, we better learn how to live as brothers and sisters or we are die as fools. COVID has brought out some barriers that need to come down in America. America is no better than any other country. And no other country is better than America. There's no people better than people of color. And people of color are no better than anybody else. No, 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 no. Race don't make us better than anybody else. Those who survived the pandemic come to grips by respecting the, uh, uh, the attack of the invisible enemy, but it's only by God's grace. His plans change when his plans interfere with his purpose. His plans change when the Father said so. But then the text says that Jesus went to Sychar and there he found Jacob's well. He was tired and he sat down. And you read on, he sat down and he sent his boys to town to get some food. This, this got me because... The text says that Jesus got tired. Jesus got weary. Jesus got wore out. Jesus, our Savior and Lord, the perfect blend of divinity and humanity. How could he be so much God and yet so much man? Jesus, who was very God or very God, the old theologian said, and yet very man of very man. It's a mystery. It's like what John said at the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How is that, John? What a mystery. That when we read about the life of Jesus, Jesus, who got sleepy, yet he could pray all night. Jesus, who got hungry, yet could turn rocks into bread. Jesus, who pleased the Father so much that at least twice the Father turned on the heavenly PA and announced, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Yet this same Jesus wept over Jerusalem and wept when, when Mary's heart was grieved over the death of her brother. The humanity of Jesus would allow him to touch the untouchable, yet the divinity of Jesus would not allow him to be tainted by their touch. The combination of his humanity and divinity is mind-boggling. How could he be so much God and yet so much man how could he be so much God that he could 
walk on the water in a storm that was tossing and turning a boat full of 12 disciples, yet he can walk calmly on that and not be tired, and yet he didn't walk from Judea to Samaria, and he's tired to the point he has to sit down. His divinity and his humanity is never more on display than what we see in this text here. That he changed his plans. This is what I got out of this. Boy, help me. It blessed me. I hope it helped you. He changed his plans when his humanity kicked in and grace had kicked out. He changed his plans when his human strength was no longer there. See, sometimes in church world, we, we try to act superhuman. Like we're never tired, or the preacher never supposed to get tired, or the deacon never supposed to get tired, or them church folks never supposed to get tired. And we act like this, and we're supposed to always keep going like the Energizer Bunny. In Jesus, I see something here. He got tired. He got weary. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and his humanity got the better part of him some days. Now, now, now I'll be the first to say that I, I have experienced this personally, that there are times when my humanity gets the best of me, where I am no longer strong enough to do what I need to do. And I have experienced being just completely empty of me. And grace kicks in. And even though I'm weak and weary, with God's grace, I'm able to do what I would not be able to do otherwise. I got that. I got that. I, I, I testify that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I got that. I got that. There are times in the Christian life where we have to not depend on ourselves. In fact, I have learned, we talk about how God won't put no more on you than what you can bear. That's a lie. That God does put some stuff on you, more than you can handle. Because as long as you can handle it, you don't need him. That God puts some heavy stuff on you. Because sometimes you won't get down where you need to get to, so he puts some heavy stuff on on you to get you down where you really need to be. Because when you get down where you need to be, it's then he can pick you up and give you the strength and grace that you need. I got this. I got this. That sometimes humanity kicks in and grace, I mean, humanity kicks out and grace kicks in. I got that. But that ain't what this text showed me, Joe. But there are times when your human strength ain't there, and even though you know God's purpose for you, and even though you know the work isn't done yet, you need to go sit your behind down. I don't like saying this during COVID because I think too many people are sitting on their behind now and need to get busy. But some of us are working in the wrong direction. We're working from our own strength. We're not working from the grace of God. But Jesus teaches us that when humanity kicks out and there is no grace there, you need to sit your behind down. That when you try to do more than what God has called you to do at a time when he don't want you to do it, you're doing too much. There's nothing sinful or wrong with rest. God works six days. And then he rested. Hello, mama. Hello, daddy. I'm trying to help some people who think you always got to go. You always, sometimes God just wants you to rest. Now, I need to help some people. There is a big difference between rest and retirement. Some of us embrace rest because we know we're tired. And I just need to lay this body down and lay this mind down, lay this spirit down, and let joy come in the morning. 
I got that. I, I got that. But, but some of us Christians, some of us followers of Christ, some of us believers in him have taken rest to the extreme. And for all practical purposes, we are retired. We don't do nothing. We don't say nothing. We just come to church. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Give our tithes and all that stuff. But we ain't doing nothing. Listen, God don't need your money. God had your money before you was here. God don't need you to fill these pews. He got, he got folks that know he put in these pews. But God loved you. God believes in you. God trusted you. With gifts that he's implanted inside of you. Gifts that can't nobody use but you because they're your gifts. They're your talents. They're your skills. He poured into you and he wants you to use those for his glory. But now when it's time to sit down, you just got to sit down. And you got to rest. That's what Jesus did. That's what, that's what Jesus, Jesus did. He sat down and he rested. And you know what he found out? That when he rested, he ran smack dab into somebody God wanted him to talk to. That it's time for your plans to change or have a change of plans, not only in what you are doing when your plans does not help you fulfill your purpose, and not only when God says so, but I've learned that God often speaks through the circumstances of my life. I, I wish I could not just fly a plane, but own a plane. I love the travel and I love heights. If I had my own plane right after this service, I'd be headed to the airport. I'd be gone somewhere. I would, but it's not God's will for me to fly a plane or to have a plane. Not right now, and I know that. <laughs> not because the Holy Ghost slapped me upside the head. I know that. Not because some prophet prophesied that to me. I know that because of the circumstances in my life. And some of us are missing what God has for us because we're not reading the tea leaves of our own lives. If the door ain't open, why you keep knocking and knocking and kicking and kicking? Try the other door. If you can't get it done, if you can't change something, how about letting the one who can change all things change it? You say you believe in him. You say you trust him. You say he hear your prayer. Then let him handle it. Sometimes God just want us to sit our behind by the well and see who he going to send by our path. There are people going to hell because we won't sit our behind down. You're doing too much. You're doing too much. Look at somebody tell me you're doing too much. sat down and they sat down there we'll see next week some wonderful things start to happen that proved to be not an interruption to his plan but a continuation to his plan yeah it's mind boggling and mind blowing that God actually want to use you and me to get the world to know him better. Most who are looking at me think, okay, I know God used you. You know, he's been using you. You know, you went to school and you've been preaching and pastoring a long time. But you don't know me, Rev. You don't know how much weed I done smoked. You don't know who I've been laying with. You don't know the folks I cussed out. I just got out of jail last year, you know. You don't, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to know. 
All I need to know is that God woke you up. All I need to know is that God still give you his breath. All I need to know is that God still put his, his mercy on you. And his mercy says that whatever your mess is, your mission is greater than your mess up, so he gives you grace to cover it. All I need to know is that God believes in you, and if God believes in you, I can't help but to believe in you. I know it's mind-boggling that God wants to use you to touch the lives of other people. I, I'm, I, need, I, I wish I could just cut you open and put this at the core of your being because you need to get this. God really wants to use you. You, you, you're not just a throw-in. You, you're not an extra in the movie. You are the movie. You need to get that. If, if, if the barriers of racism, the barriers of gender bias, the barriers of religious bigotry and division, are, if those barriers are going to get broke, you got to play your part in your movie. You, you got to have a change. You, you can't just sit around and be a spectator. You, 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 got, you got to make a change. You, you got to make a change. He has all these people in the world, and yet he wants you. Yeah, he wants you, and today he's talking to you through me. And I don't know what your plans are. Your plans probably something like this. You want to live good. You want to make a good life, make some money. You want to find love, real love. You want to make a name for yourself. You want people to know you. You want to help a few people. You may want to help a lot of people. You may want to travel or buy a lot of things, have a career, make a name for yourself. Did I say make a name for yourself? Yeah. Because pride always pushes us in our planning. Sound like a good plan. But check this out. Jesus asked a question that I want to ask today that you need to consider in all your planning. What would it profit a man or a woman to gain this whole world and lose his soul? You see, our plans have to include our soul. You see, when my soul is not happy, I'm never happy. When my soul is not happy, I don't care how much I drink. I ain't that high. When my soul is not happy, I don't care who I marry. I'm still not happy. When my soul is not happy, I don't care how much money I make. I'm still not satisfied. But oh, when it's well with my soul, <laughs> I can have a shack in the eyes of others, but I got a mansion in my eyes. When my soul is happy, I'm happy by myself. Don't need nobody else. When my soul is happy. When our soul is happy, we find courage to face the barriers and break the barriers that can help us live the life God has for us. Jesus came to our world, and I'm done. Jesus came to our world because sin was the greatest barrier that blocked mankind from God. He came to break that barrier. His death broke the barrier of sin. His death unlocked the door of hell so that those who believe in him wouldn't be locked in hell for the wages of sin is death. That separation from God, that's hell. His death broke the barrier and allowed us not to stay in hell but we still needed a bridge to get to heaven so he died to break the barrier of sin but he got up to build the bridge to heaven because God wants us to go there 
And I want to, I want to encourage you today to consider changing your plans. Many have embraced God as their Savior, but not as their Lord. I mean, he, we know when we die, we'd have made reservation when I die in the great by and by, I'm going to heaven. But for right now, I'm going to live all the hell I can. Now, we got God just as an insurance policy. That's not what God saved you for. If that's all he wanted out of you, the moment he saved you, he could have called you home. You could have died just there. But he left you here because God has something great for you to do. Listen, there are people who won't listen to me. I'm the preacher. I got that. That's why I don't tell folks I'm a preacher when I'm out on the golf course. I tell them I'm, I'm over human resources at a savings institution. I am. Because <laughs> people look at preachers and say, oh, you're a preacher. Oh, no, 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 no. But they won't listen to me. Not yet. But they'll listen to you. You got family, you got friends, you got co-workers. And in some cases, what this text is tailored to teach us, Kathy, that there's some folks we don't even know who gonna come to us and, and watch this when we see this next week. They gonna need just what we say we need. You thirsty, they thirsty. What you drinking? What you drinking? It's so easy to have conversations. And the way we live out the will of God and help folks get across the bridge is simply by talking to them. But like the Jews of the day, we spend more time avoiding people than embracing people. I want to encourage you to consider putting God as a prefix to your plans. Don't throw out your plans, but put him in front of your plans. Jesus said it like this, seek first the kingdom of God and all those other things will be added to you. I know you, look, you, you think you got your plans together. You think you got this great idea of what family life should be, what a career would be. You got this great magical idea of what life going to be after COVID and how you're going you gonna to bag it all up. You're going to get paid. But I want to suggest to you, saint and sinner, that you make God a prefix to your plans. That you ask God, God, now this is what I think I want to do, and I think this is what you want me to do. But what do you say? I, I dare you to put God in front of your plans. If you put God in front of your plans, I promise you, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, it haven't entered into your mind what great and awesome things God has in store for you. I got to quit. There comes a time in life when we have to have a change, need a change of plans. Perhaps somebody here today, somebody online, will need a change of plans. What you thought was going to get you somewhere and it's not getting you there, it's time to change your plans. When God says it's time to change, it's time to change your plans. When your humanity kick out and the grace of God kicks out, it's time to change your plans. You're doing too much. You're doing too much. You're doing too much. Why don't you just believe him? Why don't you just trust him? To so give the invitation, if there's anyone here today that have yet to surrender to Christ, won't you come today? Come on, you can do this. He woke you up to do this. He, he, he stirred you up to do this. He got you dressed this morning to do this. You can do this. Won't you come? Come on, come on. Come on, you can do this. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Come on, you. Yes, you can do this. Portion. I believe, and I believe mm. you're more than enough. More for than me. enough. Hey, Jesus, you're all I need. That's what you tell him. Jesus, you're I all I need. I believe you're my healer. You're my healer. I believe, 
And I believe you are all you're all I need. Today is your day. I believe. I believe you're my portion. You can do this. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. Jesus, you're all I need. Nothing is Nothing impossible is impossible. You. No. Nothing is Somebody ought to testify. Impossible. No, 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 no. Nothing no, no, because hey. you. you hold my world, you hold my world, yeah. Nothing, nothing, nothing is impossible. impossible. You ought to say that. Nothing is hey. impossible. Oh, nothing. nothing. to God. Nothing is impossible. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise as we prepare. Listen, if you're tired of being where you are and you need something different at this stage in your life, listen to what Jesus said over 2,000 years ago. He said, come to me, all of you who are tired from the heavy burden that you've been forced to carry, and I will give you rest. So I want to invite you today to just come just as you are. God loves you just the way you are. He just loves you too much to leave you that way. So won't you come? If you're thirsty, come. If you're hungry, come. If you're broke and broken, come. If you're tired and weary, you can come. He said, come now and let us read them together. And though your sins be bright red, I'll wash them white as snow. He said, come while it's day, for the night is going to come when you won't be able to come. So won't you come to him who came for you? He came as a baby. He lived as a servant. He died as a man, but he got up as a God, because that's who he is. And make no mistake about it, he came for you. He lived for you. He died for you. He got up for you. He left for you. He's praying for you and he's coming back again for you. So won't you come to him today? He woke you up this morning to come. He spared your life so you could have this opportunity to come. He made a way for you to hear this and see this today so that you could come. My recommendation is that you would come who have not yet come to him. Right where you are, you can pray this simple prayer. Father, forgive me for all of my sins. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he loved me, he came for me, and he died for me. And I believe he got up from the dead. 
and I believe he's coming back again. Father, please come into my heart, come into my life, and make me what you'll have me to be. I surrender my all to you. In the name of your Son, and my now Savior and Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. So glad to have more family members. God wants us all saved. But everybody won't be, but I'm glad that you are. So now can I encourage you to find a church home that you could connect with and you can learn more about God and learn more about prayer and the Bible and Jesus and most of all, learn more about God's will for your life. I promise you God wants more for you than you want for you. I ask you to come today because I came and he made such a wonderful difference in my life and in the lives of millions of others. I know he's going to do the same for you. Peace. Thanks for tuning in. Subscribe to this YouTube page for more videos. You can also catch us every Sunday morning, 9 a.m. on Facebook Live. Or you can catch us on our website at www.lbethel.com where you could register to come visit us here in Redford, Michigan. Listen, if you were blessed by this ministry, by this message today, then won't you consider giving by mail? You can mail it in or you can use Cash App or you can use Givelify. We're there also. But know this, we can't wait to connect with you again. Peace.